Hello, Packer fans. Welcome to the Green 19 Podcast. My name is J.R. Radcliffe, live and in person in Lambeau Field, uh, inside the bowels of Lambeau Field, joined by my colleagues at PackersNews.com, Ryan Wood, Tom Silverstein. You guys have had a chance to check out practice here for the last couple weeks. First of all, it's great to see your faces without the, the whole like stream yard set up in between. That's kind of well, nice. J.R., you walk past me. You don't even tell me you're coming. <laughs> and I'm just like standing on the sideline before practice, just waiting for the team. They're inside the Hudson Center waiting for them to come out. And you walk past, I'm like, I know him. Yep, I, I work with him. It's true. That's how I knew you were coming today. So. Yes. Good to see you. Yes, good to see you guys as well. Um, I got to watch some practice. I want to talk some kicking again. Uh, I want to talk just in general what we've seen the first two weeks. Family night is coming up this weekend. Um, Tom, I'll start with you. I, I think the, the, the question I have is sort of who the stars have been. That's probably overstating it of practice thus far. Maybe the surprises. I'll tell you the name that comes to mind for me is Rashid Walker, because I don't know if we knew he was for sure the left tackle going into camp, and now I feel like maybe that's where we are. But I kind of just opened the floor, and I'll have you guys both answer that. Who are the people that have really stood out that you have really caught your eye this camp? Well, the one thing about training camp practice is that it's it's much harder to see and judge offensive line play and defensive line play because you know they're not allowed to sack the quarterback. They're not allowed to cut block. They're not allowed – to do a lot of things so you kind of have to just do your best to evaluate um it's it's really the skill players and um the defense you know the the back back end of the defense that that you can probably tell the most i would say the thing that's um i i've noticed the most um is either Probably the play of the wide receivers, um, it's been very veteran-like as opposed to last year when you just didn't know what they were going to run or um, what kind of connection they'd have with Love. And you can see Love has a great connection with Dontavian Wicks. Um, you know, he scored uh, – in the, he scored the touch, winning touchdown and the two-point conversion in two minute last uh, the other day, and then almost got in the end zone. Had a spectacular deep catch. And Romeo Dobbs has been really good. He's been all over the place. He's been battling Jair Alexander in one on ones and pretty much smoked him um, at least a half dozen times. So that's kind of what stands out to me. You know, to carry that train of thought. Christian Watson's already got two deep balls on, on go balls. Jaden Reed, we know what he's about. I mean, he showed last year as a rookie. He's he's their top four. It's really solid. And we know they even go deeper than that. But with that said, I think what stood out to me is the other side of that equation, the back end of the defense, which has gotten its hand on a lot of footballs and has made a lot of interceptions to start camp. A lot of that had to do maybe a little bit with uh, – Jordan loves holding, not practicing. When you're going against a backup quarterback, uh, you're, you're, you're going to have more opportunities. But this is a defense that did not have near enough interceptions last year. It's a defensive coordinator that comes from a DB track. And even with Jordan Love back at practice, they're, they're still getting interceptions. They're picking off the football in a way that I don't think they did a year ago this time. So I think that you know as good as the, the receivers have been, and, and Jordan Love looks like – Jordan Love. Uh, there's, it's entirely different than a year ago. There's no shroud of mystery over who this guy is going to be. He's the highest paid player in NFL history. He's going to be good. Uh, but the de- the defensive backs have played better. I think that they, they've got some young talent now at safety with the rookies. Uh, and t- along your you know train of thought with Rasheed Walker kind of solidifying himself early, uh, it sure looks like Eric Stokes has done the same thing. You know, and, and that's not – Carrington Valentine, uh, he's out with a hamstring these past two days. He's he's played well. I mean, he, he's he's made plays. It's not a, a fault of uh, Carrington Valentine. It's just Eric Stokes has been getting the reps. He's been making plays, and they've got some depth there. And, but it looks like he, he's the, the front runner right now, much in the way that Rasheed Walker is at left tackle, to be the starting corner opposite of Jair Alexander. Yeah, Eric Stokes is definitely a name that I had in my head as, as somebody that I was surprised was kind of solidifying running away with with that with his, that particular job. I, I, the flip side, of course, to this question is the guys that maybe haven't been as impressive as you thought. And, you know, we're talking about two weeks of 
standing some often not in pads. So I know that we're not really at a point where we're writing anybody off. Uh, I don't know if you guys have a name or two, or maybe even just a position group or two that you would be a little concerned about. Tom, is there anything that, that jumps, jumps for you right away? Um, just to, just to backtrack. Um, I, I would say, um, Jordan Morgan's another one of those guys who, um, is worth noting, um, uh, because, you know, I, I can't tell you that he's playing, you know, he's blocking perfectly or he's great in the run game or, you know, but he got slapped into a sharing role, um, at right guard with Sean Ryan, and now it's all his. So he must be doing something right, yeah. something that they like, or they see a ton of potential in him. So I just wanted to add his name to the mix. What do you think of his one-on-ones? Because um, I think he looks the part in one-on-one. Yeah, he's he's very athletic, and um, he in space he's a tough tough guy to beat. You know what's going to be the real challenge for him is is the you know hand to hand and guys, you know who can bull rush him a little bit, use their strength. Uh, but, yeah, when he can get out in some open space, he's really athletic. Um, you know, the number one person who's kind of been disappointing, um, I think, is Anders Carlson. Mm-hmm. You know, he's starting to miss some kicks. I don't think his kicks have been anywhere near as um, powerful as Greg Joseph's. Um, Greg Joseph is – has easily taken the lead in that race and you know Carlson will get a big um you know he will uh get a benefit from being a draft pick there's no question you know if it's even close to even they'll go with the draft pick but uh Joseph has has looked really good and his kickoffs are pretty good too um I would say um, Sean Clifford has been a disappointment. Mm-hmm. Um, I expected him to come out and really take advantage of being the number uh, one quarterback while Love was out, and he just threw like six interceptions, you know. So he hasn't been great. Um, you know, I haven't seen I haven't seen a lot from Luke Musgrave. I don't want to say he's a disappointment because you know he he's still someone they're going to use a lot, but I just haven't seen him in the offense. Just don't see him making uh, big plays down the middle of the field. Now, maybe that has to do with Halfley's defense, but that's another guy um, that, you know, they're going to be looking for to make some plays. You took two of my guys. Um, <laughs> the two right guys in my, in my head were Andres Carlson and Sean Clifford. Uh, I think Sean Clifford is absolutely and, – and here's what's interesting. He showed potential – Last year in preseason, when he got in the game in Minnesota, he made some plays. Like, we know that there's some potential, there's some talent there. But I think that there's a, a very legitimate number two battle job, uh, uh, competition uh, for the job between him and, and Michael Pratt. And, and that's going to really get into high gear when they get into the preseason. As far as Anders Carlson, I said, I think I said it last time, like, someone's going to blink here. They're both kicking really well. Well, this practice today, Thursday, two days before family night, Anders Carlson blinked. This was the first time that we saw one of them kind of have a stumble, a significant stumble. He was three of six today. All three of his misses, importantly, pulled to the left. And Anders Carlson said last year that was his issue. Uh, and and I feel like yeah, if this is a year ago in camp and he has a day where he misses all three to the left, that's not the worst thing because you, you can fix that, right? Like you, you know what the issue is. It's a consistent issue. Go out and fix it. But at what point is a consistent issue just a permanent issue? Because if it's continuing to be a problem, him missing kicks to the left, it's been a year. And he's 24-30 in camp. On its own, that's 80%. It's okay. It's not good, but it's not terrible either. On It's not like he's kicking miserable in, in camp. If he had a respectable rookie year, he had no, let's say hypothetically, he had no competition in camp right now. He's just 24 of 30. Like, okay, it's a bad day. He'll be, you know, he'll be fine. He, he showed something last year. He'll be fine. But he didn't have a respectable rookie season. He had a terrible rookie season. Mm-hmm. And he has competition in, in camp. And that competition, Greg Joseph is now 28 of 30 on kicks. I don't know what defines close and what not. And, and I totally agree with you, Spoon. If this is close, it's the draft pick. I don't know what's close and what's not close. But 28 and 30 and 24 of 30 are not the same. So I think family night's going to be a, a big, big moment in this kicking competition. The preseason games, obviously, as well. But Greg Joseph has a lead right now. 
Yeah, just, just subjectively, you you look at it, and his kicks are better off the. Uh, That's exactly hold. how I see it too. Yeah. You know, powerful, um, high over the net or high into the net. He almost never just hits the net straight on. He's got really um, he he out kicks the net in most. Yeah instances and it just looks like the ball comes up faster and harder now the one thing about um 80 percent is you know decent but in a training camp when you know the environment's the same every day and you're not kicking in swirling winds in a stadium then i think you got to be better than 80 percent you know i think you got to be closer to 90 because um there's no rush there's no um you know you're not fighting at the different stadiums elements in and before today he was what 22 of uh, 21 of 24 so so today was Mm -hmm. was a it was a very to me it was a significant day today but in terms of the power the leg power i've wondered i haven't asked him and and this is something that it'd be worth asking i wonder if he's if he's taken just a touch off the power than a year ago to try to be more sure of where the thing's going because mm-hmm. of all the accuracy issues that he had. Because I remember a year ago, he was kicking this, these booming kicks. I mean, he, he was crushing the football in a way that we're not seeing now. And again, when he's 21 of 24 going into the day, I kind of get it because he, he doesn't need to kill. He, he can easily hit it. He, he hit a 58-yarder today. He has the leg to hit a 58-yarder. There. Anders Carlson does not lack for leg strength, but I just I want I don't know if if you've thought this too, Spoon, but I, I've wondered if maybe he's just taken a touch off to make sure he knows where the dang thing's going. Yeah, I it, I it it could be um you know like you wrote he's got a little bit of a different approach to the ball, which may affect how it's coming off his foot. I don't know. I I think the biggest question is going to be is Joseph the guy who last year missed a bunch of kicks between 40 and 49, was really good inside 40, was pretty decent 50-plus, but, you know, the Vikings weren't falling all over themselves Mm -hmm. to sign him. And, you know, that was in – a lot of those kicks were indoors. So the Packers have to make – you know, have have to take that past into consideration – uh, but if it, if it continues on like this, then I, I don't know how they stick with Carlson. Yeah. This is an opportunity. We mentioned Jeff Halfley a couple times, and the interceptions is, is kind of something we haven't seen before from the defense in, in camp. This is a chance to see him and his, you know, the new coaching staff on the defensive side of the ball in general work with the players. Rashawn Gary talked after um, Thursday's practice, just the freedom he said that before, just the freedom he has to just be himself and and go after the guys. He had a very good start to to camp. Are, are there other you know sort of markers that show that this is a different defense than what we've seen before? And and are there any takeaways from just watching the players interact with the coaches that you know something something that just jumps out that maybe you haven't seen before? Well, the takeaways is probably you didn't mean it, um, you know, but. It is the, the difference in their defense is they got like 14 interceptions yeah. through camp. I bet they had like three <clears throat> interceptions during camp last year. They're far more aggressive to the ball. Um, now that that could lead to some big plays. They're they're fairly vanilla defense. You know they don't do a ton of stuff. You know they're going to probably be in two high or single high. Um, you know zone uh, cover three. But man, they let they let their guys fly, and um, you've seen people all over the ball. You know, McKinney's got a couple of interceptions. Um, uh, Evan Williams has three interceptions. Um, Bullard has an interception. Anthony Johnson has two interceptions. So safety play appears to be in better shape. And interceptions are almost always a byproduct of the pressure up front. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's true. When the quarterback has less time, he has to rush it, he has to hurry, he doesn't throw the ball where he wants to throw it. And I think, to me, the biggest difference, you know, when we talk about this d- new defensive scheme, 4-3, the first thing you think of is the three, right? Okay, base defense. There's three inside linebackers off the ball instead of uh, two like there, there was before. Then you think this co- defensive coordinator comes from a DB track, so that's obviously going to affect the secondary. To me, the biggest difference 
is the four three principles up front, the defensive line. Have, having four guys hands on the ground, three point stance, and their attack philosophy. It's so different than the three four. I was talking with Kenny Clark about the difference between the, the three four of, of yesteryear and, and the four three now. And he said he said something I hadn't even thought. He said, you know, it basically our formationally we were a four two five, right? We were a nickel defense just like every other team. So we were a lot closer to a four three formationally than a three four. But we were playing that four three with three four principles, which is essentially build a wall it, you know it's not like you don't want to get into the backfield but it's it's you you want to hold up blockers let the guys behind you make plays flow and make plays the benefit of the three four is that you can be a lot more creative with where you're bringing the blitz from you can you can br- bring the blitz from all over in the three four what's weird is that the packers defense didn't really blitz much from the three four so that kind of negated the benefit of the three four the four three is designed it's like it's like a track it's it's like a track sprinter getting off the line at the start gun every snap. Run, run, run. Get into the backfield. Rashawn Gary being a three-point stance is something to see. Uh, you know, it's that's the mentality now with this 4-3. Now, now they're playing 4-3 with 4-3 principles. Uh, I think there's a lot of excitement up front. There's a lot of talent up front. This Packers defensive line was the unquestioned strength of the defense last year. They actually had a good year in 2023. It was everyone else that, that had struggled, especially in the back end. Uh, I think this talent with this scheme, that that has a lot to do with the interceptions. And I, I think that you know they're very high on the kind of pass rush they can have. You wrote Ryan one of the stories that has has intrigued me, and that's Kingsley and Igbare being here, being effective, looking great. This is a guy who we all thought tore his ACL and I think did tear his ACL uh, in the playoff game against Dallas last year. So if in a normal human being timeline, he would definitely not be here playing. He may not be here at all this season. So what in the world is going on there? Because he's, he's medically cleared. So he's obviously healthy and looking great. But, uh, but I know you got to talk to him a little bit. I, I, it's still kind of confusing though. What exactly is ailing him or was ailing him? I was telling Spoon, like, I, I still don't know that I fully understand what the heck is going on here. Let's be very clear. And, and Kinsley Anikbari was very clear. He tore his ACL. It was a partial tear, not a full tear, but he partially tore his ACL. Okay. So it's not like he didn't tear his ACL. He partially tore his ACL. And I don't know that he, like, he fully understood. He, he, he was point blank. He said, I don't understand all the science to it. Um, but he was medically cleared without surgery. And even when the doctors told him that, Kingsley Bar said, like, he, he was, there were some nerves, like, really? Because, like, if you know anything about football, you know that a torn ACL means knee surgery and you're out a year. Like, that's just automatic. It is absolutely automatic. That's what happens. I, Spoon, have you ever, have you ever seen an, you've covered the league a lot longer than me. Have you ever seen an ACL tear that didn't result in surgery? I, I can't think of one. Um, <laughs> I remember Garrison Hurst played without an ACL, yeah. like he didn't have one or something like that. I can't remember. Back. Yeah. But no, I can't I can't remember an ACL that wasn't repaired. Yeah, I know I haven't seen it. So Kingsley and Ibarre says that the doctors have cleared him medically. He's no more at risk of needing knee surgery than anyone else. He can play on it. He does require daily maintenance. His hamstring, his quad, his calf – Every day, he has to build the muscles there to be able to support the knee because, again, there is a torn ligament in that knee. Uh, It's just something that he can play on. And so if you don't need the knee surgery and kill a year of your career, sure, why why not go that route? You know, that's kind of where they're – and he feels that – he, he, there, there's no guarantee it's going to hold up, but he feels he's doing everything he can for that. To, and you know, he had uh, on Wednesday, he had a sack. He had a PBU on Jordan Love. Uh, he is a really important player to this defense. He is the type of, of player that, that fills out the depth of a roster at a premium position. He's not a star. He's not going to, you know, he, he's had five sacks in two years. But having that type of a, a, a playmaker at a premium position at, in a backup role. Uh, it, it's important. I, they they absolutely, as Matt Lafleur said this offseason, they dodged a bullet there. I lost my train of thought for a second. <laughs> it's been, I'm a little worried about the streak of undrafted free agents making this team because they have so many guys spoken for, so many spots spoken for. Obviously, it was a very young team. They've had two massive draft classes back to back. There's a lot of there's a lot of bodies in camp that you kind of know they're going to make the team. Uh, as we get into family night, as we get into the po- the preseason, are, are there are there guys that Packer fans should watch for, like, 
or or is this is this it? Like maybe it doesn't happen this way. Wow, that's a great question. I, I wish I had my roster with me. <laughs> um, whew, is there someone who's undrafted? Um, no, not not from this class. Um, you know, there are some from previous classes, like Emmanuel Wilson of could course, make the yep. team. Joel Wilson, the tight end. Who? Malik Keith, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, Peter Bowden, as the long snapper, has been cut and returned, so yeah, at least they like him to some degree. He's but. a possibility, um, <laughs> although Orzek has been snapping Solid, yep. much, much better. Um, <laughs> man, that's a hard one. I'm thinking of offensive linemen, usually. They, they find somebody, you know, like a Caleb Jones or something like that, but they are so – so deep and they keep adding such so many draft picks that Mm -hmm. i don't know there's one guy who's really aggressive and i want to see in live action um is uh, i think it's Raphael goforth he's Mm. a uh inside linebacker okay he just throws himself he's (laughs) undersized you know but he he's like a missile out there so it'll it'll be interesting to see if he can do anything um I was going to say Kalen King, but he's a draft pick. Yep, seventh rounder, sure. Um, yeah, wow. I don't think it's going to happen, Spoon. That streak could be broken. Yeah, yeah, right. it really could. Because, because here's, uh, I think Peter Bowden might have the best chance, and I don't think he's going to be Peter Bowden as a long snapper. I think he's going to be Matt Orzek. So, yeah, I, 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 the, the problem they have, well, it's a good problem, is even their practice squad guys from next from yeah. last year are somewhat impressive you know like grant debose is yeah. on the practice squad and he's made some really nice plays and has a chance to make the roster um you know these guys uh, they, they just have too much um for those guys to to make the 53 yeah. but you'll see them on the practice squad yeah all right let's go from the bottom of the roster to the top because we have seen now a week of jordan love and uh we last time we podcast we hadn't seen him he had just signed his his massive extension what are your thoughts there? I mean, I think it's it's obvious that the offense is better with him than you know than without him. But um, you know, it isn't like the offense is overwhelming the defense. We've been talking about the interceptions. So just in terms of what you've seen from him, spoon, what, uh, what what's your early you know prognosis there? Well, I'll tell I'll tell you what the biggest difference you know with Sean Clifford and Love was uh, Clifford, you know, reacting to some of the pressure had to find throwing lanes, you know, had to move around and even just in the pocket to be able to deliver the ball. Jordan Love can throw over pressure. So, you know, if, if Kenny Clark is, is pushing the center back, he's still got the ability, you know, at 6'5", um, with that long arm, he can, he can throw it over the top. He can throw – he has uh, numerous – arm angles that he uses too so if Kenny Clark's in his face and and he needs to throw it with you know a 40 degree angle he can do that too we saw with the um Dontavian Wicks touchdown yet on Wednesday he pretty much sidearmed that ball to get it in the middle so he he reacts and handles pressure so much better um he's He's really good at reading the rush, I think, too, and gets rid of the ball. So the the big thing, um, you know, he, he's thrown a couple interceptions. He's um, probably now starting to hit his groove. You know, it's been a full week now, and I would guess that, um, you know, now we'll see maybe even a little better performance. You know, I'm old enough, Spoon, to remember Matt LaFleur begging Jordan Love to let it rip. Uh, he doesn't have to do that anymore. Yeah. He lets it rip now. And the, the, there's, there was a, I think it was uh, an individual drill. So he was he was rolling, and uh, he the the torque that he puts on the body. He made an out route to Jaden Reed, and I think it was in Indy. He made an out route um, ball to Jaden Reed on the right sideline, and the torque like it's he just he lets it rip in a way that he he didn't early in his career. And it looks more confident. Like he just has more confidence than he had, where where he can he can just really let let his arm go. Um, he knows where it's going. Uh, as far as the interceptions, look, he closed last year with 
last regular season with 18 touchdowns and one pick. I'm not too worried about the interceptions in, in July, in August. Uh, I think it's kind of silly. And I've had, you know, some, some Packers fans on my, on my feed kind of like uh, freaking out about the interceptions. Like this is a fan base for, for the longest time with Aaron Rodgers that said, boy, force it in there more, make more plays. They never throw interceptions. You, you, chance it, you know, make more plays. I feel like that's what Jordan Love is doing now. Where he, you know, he he'll use practice to stretch the boundaries of what is possible. He might throw a pick in practice because of it, but that's what you, that's what you use practice for. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like the flip side of it. And no, I'm not gonna. I I, I don't see any reason to freak out about Jordan Love's picks. Uh, we've seen in the regular season, his first year as a starter, he he takes good care of the football. Yeah, he he's not afraid to um, dump the ball over the middle. You know, which right. Rogers did not like to do because it risked an interception yeah, a going off the yep. running back's hands. He, he, he likes to throw right in the middle of a guy, a wide receiver sits down five yards out. He'll take that. I, he did that with AJ Dillon. And I can't remember which drive it was um, on Thursday, but you know, he could have looked, you know, downfield. It was third and like eight and he dumps it, to Dylan, and sure enough, he was wide open, yeah. and you know he got the first down. So I just think he's um, like there's no there's no obsessions in his game like hmm. that. He has to throw two interceptions or else he's a failure. Yeah. You know, I think he's I think he just is playing the quarterback position. Similar to the question about the undrafted guys goes back to a conversation we had on the last podcast about they have some salary cap relief now and could theoretically add when cutdowns roll in or even, you know, via other means, via trade or whatever. Do you, I know it's only been a week, but like, do, do you still feel like that's a possible route for them? And there's a position group out there where they could really add somebody of, of considerable note, given the fact that they have this freedom to do so now. I think it's I think it's just insurance. I think if something happens to one of their top receivers, something happens to one of their pass rushers, something happens, um, you know, to an offensive lineman, you know, then, you know, sh- sure, they – you have to assume they're going for a Super Bowl this yeah. year. And um, the way they've structured everything, they, they want to make it this year. And I think they've given them that that leeway if something happens. Football's full of injuries, and, you know, someone's going to get hurt. And if it's someone really critical, then they have that possibility, something open to, to take a rent-a-player, you know. I think it's much more likely and certainly preferable to save that cap for your guys because there's a lot of talent in this roster. And that's and it's cheap right now, but it's not going to be cheap forever. So the more you can save to re-sign your own with this roster, I, I think that that's, that's the design of it. Now, it, it'll be interesting because right, right now as we sit here, I think this is a really talented roster. I think that most positions have not just talent but depth. I don't know where the glaring hole is of like, oh, you need a guy here. You need to add talent. I just don't see that right now. But because I don't see it right now doesn't mean that I won't see it in a month, right? You know, week three, week four, we'll get, oh, oh that's where it is. Like, that's possible. Yeah, by the trade deadline, we might see a place where they have a glaring hole. I, I don't, I'm not saying they don't have one. I just, I don't see it right now. So without that, that means you have a lot of talent. You, you save the cap space to sign your own because that's not going to be cheap forever. So family night's on the horizon, joint practices in the not-too-distant future. Matt LaFleur was kind of coy about the details of family night. What was up with that? <laughs> Tommy was just like, you gotta got to show up and find I, out. I'm what just the- like, <laughs> dude, 35th the year, don't pull that on me. You know, I, don't pull that card on me. I loved yeah. it. Come on, was it was your reaction when You've he was been like, too yeah. many family nights at this point? Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's ridiculous. There's <laughs> some freaking tackling in there. My God, it's football. You know, at least use the bottom roster guys to, you know, so you can learn something about them because you only got three preseason games. So throw them out there and let them hit. So this is thirty thirty fifth for you. Is that right? Yeah, I believe so. This is my eleventh, and I can I can um, confidently tell you that I care very, very little about the details of the family night practice. I just, I just, sorry, I, I don't, I don't have it in me to care that much how this, the, how this practice is going to be structured. We'll see what it is. 
It'll be what it is. To play coy on it, like I can't imagine at 35, like how little you care about the structure of this family night practice. <laughs> I just want something that makes it interesting, you know? Yeah. Or, you know, maybe they do like they did with uh, Mason Crosby that one year and have them kick like 12, have those guys <laughs> kick like 12 That'd be perfect, field though. <laughs> goals, you know? Just make the last hour all field goals. Like, do something entertaining, you know? Yeah. Any other stray observations you guys have rattling around your brains before we uh, shut this down? Ryan, you can go first if you want. Put me on the spot. Not really. Um, I don't care about the structure of family night practice, but I do think, you know, er, er, when it was Mason Crosby as a kicker, like when you're at the family night practice, when they do field goals, that's the time to get a beer or go to the restroom or whatever. Like that, this is – it's going to be very interesting to watch this kicking battle starting fam- family night. Like, what's going to happen? Um, is it going to stay the way it is or not? Because this is a Super Bowl contending team. And this is a roster that doesn't have very many at all glaring weakness. But kicker's one. And when you're a Super Bowl contender and kicker's the, the most glaring issue that you have, that's that's why we're talking. We've never talked this much in camp about the kicking mm-hmm. situation. But this is a bona fide situation and uh you know, family that's going to be a, a, a really good backdrop for that so i'm very much looking forward to seeing that 